Hey, 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 today is National Moldy Cheese Day. I swear, gang, I do not make these things up. It is National Moldy Cheese Day. I have said before, I am not a huge uh, cheese fan. I mean, I like cheese on pizza and you know, things like that. I don't, I don't like cheese on hamburgers and things like that. I, like, I don't like cheese messing with the flavor stuff. I like quesadillas and tacos and... But I certainly am not a fan of moldy cheese by any stretch of the imagination. So I don't know why we're celebrating it today here in the U.S. I honestly don't know. But there is something that I do know, and that is the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm back once again. I'm Jeff McAleer, the host here at The Daily Dope, presented by TheGamingGang.com, of which I am the editor and uh, founder. I guess I'm the editor-in-chief. Kind of grand poobah is how I like to describe it. So, welcome aboard. Today is Tuesday, October 9th. Hopefully you are not uh, sitting there munching on moldy cheese. Ugh. I don't know. Pretty strange, but got some news today, and I am also going to do a little bit of a how to play, but mainly review Archmage. This is uh, from Starling Games. I'm going to be taking a look at the Collector's Edition. I think I know a few of the things that are in the Collector's Edition that are not in the standard retail edition. I will talk about that in just a bit. So before I jump to the news, I do want to say thank you to those out there who are subscribing to the Gaming Gang channel. Very cool. I really appreciate that. I find it funny that um, it took me forever to go from like 900 to 1,000 subscribers. And after I hit 1,000, it's like boom, 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 like two, three, four every day. So that's kind of cool. So thank you very much. Welcome aboard. Speaking of YouTube, there is chat available. This is a live stream, although I know vast majority of you out there are watching this after the fact, but if you are watching live, if you want to just say hello, or if you have a question or a comment, or when I'm talking about Archmage, if you want me to delve into something a little bit deeper, by all means, chime in. It is not on screen. Chat is off screen, but I do keep an eye on it. So if you do chime in, I will respond. I will not just sit there and just, you know, stare off into space and let you just keep typing into the ether. Although, unless uh, it's some crazy comments, then those I don't uh, I don't respond to. Anywho, got, uh, got quite a bit of news today. I do want to point out, there are people out there who watch and they, they hate the news portion of the show. There are other people who really dig the news portion of the show. I specifically go and I do timestamps on the video so you can jump ahead if you don't want to watch the news. All right, just letting people know because there are a couple of um, Asperger types out there who uh, just love to like post 22 minutes of commercials as a comment on YouTube. And of course I just delete the comment because it's stupid. Anyway, I know I talked about that a little bit yesterday, but it's just kind of irritating. It's sort of like you go to Board Game Geek or you go to other websites right to, to find out about new games i'm not these aren't commercials i'm just telling you what's on the horizon or what's just come out or maybe something cool that's on kickstarter that i can tell you yeah i believe you'll get it if you support the kickstarter so let's move into the news and speaking of kickstarter kind of a double dose of starling games today i am doing the review for archmage and they just launched a new kickstarter for Pretty interesting looking science fiction game, and it's Zero Fear Nothing. Here's the dope. Zero Fear Nothing is a one versus all hidden movement game of science fiction horror. Plays a group of science students stranded on a failing space station, trying to hunt down the creature that is terrorizing the station. That is, before it finds you first. Though a mix of, I should say, through... A mix of tactical movement and deduction, Zero Fear Nothing offers immersive tension, cutthroat decisions, 
and gripping player interaction. Left for dead, three young students fight for their lives against an unknown entity. The creature, if that is what it is, seems to learn and evolve to counter their every move. They must hunt it down and destroy it before it finds them first. As I mentioned, Zero Fear Nothing is a hidden movement, deduction, and combat game for two to four players. Players in this game are divided into two teams. One player is the creature, while the other players are the students. The goal of each team is to eliminate the other by depleting their health pool. Students share a collective health pool the creature needs to feed to stay alive, either on the fuel or the students themselves. The students will be working to destroy the creature's fuel sources and to damage it with improvised weapons like traps and stun batons. The students have cards with abilities on them that let them attack or take other actions. However, when they use one of these actions, they must give the card to the creature. That's interesting. I guess that's how it's learning uh, to anticipate the various moves the students make or learning from the actions the students take. The cards have inverse abilities for the creature that will give it new powers like possess or teleport. If the creature gets enough cards, it will also be able to evolve and develop even more powerful abilities. Kind of like the thing or what was that? Life. That was a pretty wild movie. If you haven't seen that, pretty, pretty creepy. If, uh, especially if you like uh, Alien. The game ends when the health pool for either the creature or the students is depleted. Now, Sterling Games has put together a Kickstarter video. It's a little more than a minute long. It's not very long, but let's kick back and give it a watch. You're ready to take the next giant leap in your potential. Reach beyond the limits of Earth-based science education. Join us at the Taurus Institute, the state-of-the-art education research facility for physics, engineering, biology, and artificial intelligence. Now accepting applications for fall 2143. The Taurus Institute. Explore everything. Be anything. Fear nothing. Zero Fear Nothing is, as mentioned previously, for two to four players, ages 14 and up, plays in 30 to 60 minutes, and you can reserve a copy of the game as well as unlock stretch goals for a $49 pledge through October 25th. Expected delivery is October of next year. Rats, because this sounds pretty cool. I'd like to see this a lot quicker than next October. Oh, well, hey. What can I tell you? Do you want to mention, um, when I do Kickstarter news pieces, I always share news pieces from companies that I, I really truly believe you will get the game, okay? I am not one of these people who I uh, share a lot of news from first timers, you know, companies I'm never heard of. Uh, so you can, you can kind of take it to the bank that you will get the game or book or whatever uh, you happen to pledge for because um, I vet my, my Kickstarter news pretty hard. And Sterling Games did Everdell. They did a Kickstarter for that. I believe they did a Kickstarter for Archmage. Uh, and of course, <laughs> I've already reviewed Everdell. We love it. And of course, I'm going to review Archmage in just a bit. Another thing I thought was interesting is there's only one uh, pledge level here. It's $49 for the game. That's it. There aren't a ton of different extras for you to jump into. So... I don't know if they're going to do kind of like a collector's edition like they have with some of their games or not. Okay, there is a new historically based tile laying game coming early next year from Z-Man Games. And I've got the dope on the Great City of Rome. 
The emperor of the greatest civilization in history calls for the finest master architects to rebuild Rome. Compete against your fellow architects for blueprints and materials and manage your resources carefully to sculpt a city where any citizen can live and thrive. That doesn't sound like the Roman Empire that I, I am aware of. Any citizen can thrive? I don't know about that. The construction of a city is a complex endeavor requiring meticulous planning, dedicated workers, and sturdy materials. Before the work can start, players must first travel to the court of the emperor for blueprints and materials to enact their plan. Using emissaries to earn the emperor's favor, players can claim spaces on a unique action strip to strategically prepare and move their city plan forward. At the start of each round, players reveal a set of available building cards each with their own attributes, as well as flip one of these six unique action strips. Using their emissaries, players claim spaces on the action strip, carefully choosing the placement to earn the right to claim the best building cards or maximize the number of actions they can take. Once emissaries have been placed on the unique action board, my god, how many times are they going to say unique action board in this press release? Players draft building cards, resolve actions, and construct buildings in order from closest to farthest from the Golden Emperor Pawn. Send out your emissaries wisely, spending less time beseeching the Empire, Empire, Emperor, duh, leaves more time to gather resources and materials. Players receive the resources depicted on each space between their emissary and the Emperor Pawn, including the emissary space. Balancing your priorities each round is key to victory. The Great City of Rome is for two to four players, ages 10 and up. It plays in about an hour and will carry an MSRP of $39.99 when it arrives in the first quarter of 2019. Sweet. I like historically based kind of games and I like tile laying games. Really dug Warsaw from uh, my friends over at North Star Games. Really, really enjoyed. Uh, oh, I should say officially it's. Warsaw City of Ruins. <laughs> Got to make sure I get that right. But really, really dug it. And we still play it uh, from time to time. And a lot of times when I review games, it's sort of like, yeah, we enjoyed it, but it's probably not going to get off, you know, the the shelf that often. Warsaw's one that stays in the car. Yeah, my whole backseat is full of games. <laughs> so, but this does seem like a pretty interesting title coming from Z-Man Games. That seems like a $40 price tag is pretty fair. Now, there is a new game coming out from Renegade Game Studios. They're actually ready to launch the first title in an all-new Shem Phillips trilogy, and I've got the dope on Architects of the West Kingdom. Architects of the West Kingdom is set at the end of the Carolinian, or no, it's Carolinian. Isn't it Carolinian? I don't know. It's Carolingian. Carolingian? I don't know. It's not ringing a bell for me, but that's okay. Because it's circa <laughs> 850 AD. Probably not, not a period that I'm overly familiar with. As player architects, players compete, I should say, as royal architects, players compete to impress their king and maintain their noble status by constructing various landmarks throughout his newly appointed domain. Players will need to collect raw materials, hire apprentices, and keep a watchful eye on their workforce. There are treacherous times. Rival architects will stop at nothing to slow your progress. Yes, that's, that's how I am as an architect. Will you <laughs> remain virtuous? Or will you be found in the company of thieves and black marketeers? I think we know what side I'd be on. No, I'm just kidding. I usually play like a good character. The aim of Architects of the West Kingdom is to be the player with the most victory points at the game's end. Points are gained by constructing various buildings and advancing work on the Archbishop's Cathedral. Throughout the game, players will need to make a lot of moral decisions. However, only at the game's end will their virtue be judged. A few underhanded deals here and there might not seem like much, but fall too far and you will be punished. The game ends once a set number of constructions have been completed. The game features adventure with beautiful artwork and great quality components. It's the first standalone game in the West Kingdom trilogy. 
Architects of the West Kingdom is for 1 to 5 players, ages 12 and up, plays in 60 to 80 minutes. Could have just gone out and said 90. And will carry an MSRP of $50 when it arrives later this month. Gotta say, it's a Shem Phillips game. I have only played Raiders of the North Sea. That's the, that's the only title I've gotten to check out in the North Sea trilogy or series, because there are some expansions for it as well. And we really like it. And looking at some of the cards here, it looks like there's... If you're familiar with Raiders of the North Sea, I would take a guess that Architects of the West Kingdom will probably be pretty easy to slide right into and understand how to play. I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're going to be similar or that similar, but... Just kind of looking at the different uh, different uh, acolytes, I guess we would say, or apprentices, kind of leads me to believe might be a little bit of a North Sea vibe to it. Pretty sweet. Uh, and I dig the artwork. I always like the artwork. Uh, there, you know what? I should mention, I think the Kickstarter is over, but I thought it was kind of cool that there's a role-playing game that's going to be based on Raiders of the North Sea, that series. I thought that was pretty sweet. And it's got the same artist. So dig that very much. Do you want to mention there is an interesting looking gardening game that's going to be arriving in February from Pencil First Games. It's not a company I'm familiar with, but they do have quite a few titles out there. And here's the dope on Herbaceous <laughs> Sprouts, I think. Herbaceous, Baceous, do you know? Everyone has a green thumb when playing Herbaceous Sprouts. Unwind while enjoying this beautiful and thoughtful game of collecting seeds, using tools, and growing sprouts in the community garden. Gather your seeds and tools from the shed, but don't take too long or your friend might become the head gardener first. Damn you, friend! Become the head gardener by collecting urban flower seeds and using your garden tools to plant in the community garden and scoring the most points. Each round, gardeners take turns collecting urban flower seeds represented by dice, which they place and save in their wheelbarrow, as well as tools, represented by cards, which they use to plant sprouts. Players can plant quickly for low point spots, or they can push their luck, saving their seeds for premier spots in the garden. Herbacea Sprouts is played over a series of rounds, each with a different lead gardener. When the last tool cards are used, the game ends and the final score is tallied. The game is for one to four players. I thought that was interesting. There, There is solo play involved in this. It's for ages eight and up, plays in about 20 to 30 minutes, and will carry an MSRP of $39.99 when it hits stores in February of next year. Looks actually pretty interesting and, and pretty, you know, kind of mellow you know sometimes you want to play a game where it's you know there's a little competition between the players i love competition right i think that's one of the reasons why a lot of like euro style games kind of leave me flat when there's you know it's just kind of you know you're playing in a vacuum what you do really doesn't affect anybody else but uh it seems like it could have a little bit of you know take that to it yeah. kind of like uh i really enjoyed dance of the fireflies uh from uh, oh, oh, uh, Backspinal Games. Gosh, I was trying to remember the name. Backspinal Games. Uh, really enjoyed that. And it was kind of like a, you know, planting flowers in a garden sort of game. But it was like a lot of take that to it, which I, I really dug. So this is coming in February. So, uh, yeah, keep your eyes peeled. All right. My final news piece is for a Kickstarter from Cobalt Press and... I gotta say, Cobalt Press does really nice stuff. It is Tales of the Old Margrave for 5th edition. And it's, uh, I believe the entire title is Tales of the Old Margrave 5th edition Forest Adventures. Anyway, it's up on Kickstarter for Cobalt Press, and I've got the dope. Forests and fantasy role-playing games are dark places full of secrets. With this project, we bring the Old Margrave to the 5th edition of the world's most popular RPG. The Margrave is an ancient enchanted forest that defends itself from those who come to cut its timber, poach its creatures, or steal its magic. Within its borders, the old ways are strong. The force is strong with these folks. The word of the druids carries great weight, and griffins, dragons, and stranger creatures nest and hunt 
undisturbed by humans, dwarves, or other lordlings. Until your adventure party shows up, that's when things get really interesting. The Margrave Kickstarter offers three main elements. The Tales of the Old Margrave Adventure Campaign hardcover for the Game Master, with adventures from levels 1 to 10. Also, a Margrave Player's Guide soft cover book of new player options, including new races, Druid and Ranger subclasses and tools, backgrounds, and forest-themed spells. Third, if unlocked, a set of thick cardboard stand-ups, the Margrave Pawns, which are similar to those created for Tome of Beasts and the Creature Codex. There's actually a small sample that uh, I'm showing a, a slide for, but their game plan is to actually produce about 150 to 200 pawns. That is a lot of pawns, all depending on the stretch goals. So that kind of gives you an idea of just how many creatures are going to be included in this book as well. Together with some book-expanding stretch goals, this project provides new deep forest character options and a full sequence of adventures to draw adventurers into the wilderness and keep them on their toes. Right now, you can reserve a copy of the two books in PDF for a $25 pledge, or you can get the physical books plus extras for a $60 pledge through October 26th. The project is over 300% funded, and the expected delivery for both digital and print products is April of next year, so not that far off. Do you also want to mention, if you are a fan of Fantasy Grounds or Roll20, this is part of the Kickstarter as well. You can actually get the digital um, products actually tailored for like Fantasy Grounds or for Roll20. I thought that was pretty cool as well. So that's pretty nice. And I have to point out, Cobalt Press does really excellent stuff. Uh, if you have never checked out like the Creature Codex that just came out, it is pretty smashing. You know what? I should probably do a, a news piece for it because I know it recently came out on Drive-Thru RPG. And uh, I know back in the day I did release the Kickstarter news about it. So definitely check that out. But yeah, give this, uh, give this a look because I understand... The, uh, the campaign book, I believe, I'm not positive, but I do believe it was released for Pathfinder a while back. But this is actually going to be uh, expanding on this, I do believe, for 5th edition. So pretty sweet. Tales of the Old Margrave is all about that feeling of being way, way too deep in the woods. And you realize you're not alone. And whatever's lurking out there in the trees... Something pretty scary. I'm Wolfgang Bauer. I love running my adventurers out into the woods and screaming through the shade. And Cobalt Press will help you do the same. In these adventures, you'll encounter shapeshifters, golems, strange dragons, weird talking cats. Baba Yaga and her hut make an appearance. All sorts of archetypal creatures from the dawn of storytelling. Living still in the depths of the old Margrave. And of course, there's the forest itself. The Margrave is a living thing, and it doesn't exactly welcome strangers who go against the old ways. It's a place so full of magic, your spells may not work the way you're used to. I am super excited about the crew of designers and artists and cartographers who are bringing the old Margrave to life for 5th edition. It's an amazing team. If you are looking for 5e adventures, that range in tone from, say, charming yet mildly creepy to downright down pants wettingly, wettingly terrifying. terrifying, then this is a book you should check out. The Old Margrave is a great setting for any campaign with a forest. I hope you'll join us in bringing this magical, mysterious realm to 5th edition. I was so busy <laughs> rambling on about the Kickstarter, I completely forgot I had a video. <laughs> so, duh. Hey, that's what happens. Yeah, I get carried away. <laughs> so, anywho, 
check out Cobalt Press's Kickstarter for Tales of the Margrave, or the old Margrave, I should say. Margrave. Duh. Anyway, all right. So uh, that is it for the news today. Uh, a couple of things I'm going to tackle real quick before I jump into my Archmage kind of how to play and review. Uh, and Drew Barbier's popped by. Hey, Drew, good to see you. We were chatting a little bit while that video was going. Um, so first off, I mentioned yesterday that uh, I'm going to kit bash, or I guess we'll say hack, uh, an old D&D module or a series of modules for my nephew and his friends for Dungeon World. Because I'm, I'm really getting into Dungeon World. I'm really checking stuff out. I'm really kind of digging it because I like the whole collaborative aspect of it. But still having a game master who's, you know, kind of providing, you know, the background and things like that. But not, you know, necessarily railroading everybody into doing stuff. So I have, uh, I, I basically am looking at either doing B2, the Keep on the Borderlands, or I'm going to do T1 through 4, which is the Temple of Elemental Evil, which started off with uh, the village of Hamlet. And uh, kind of toss it out there on Twitter last night. I'm actually thinking maybe I'll throw a poll out. Nobody ever votes in my polls. But anyway, I think I might throw a poll out. And uh, somebody said, hey, I recommend B2 because uh, it's pretty really easy to get into and it's just all self-contained. And maybe the players won't have the kind of stamina to see out the whole temple of elemental evil to the end which reality wise once you know once they finally got to temple of elemental evil out about oh i don't know six years after the release of village of hamlet it basically that starts off that whole series that has like against the giants and then it concludes with the drow i remember that back in the day as a kid picking those modules up and uh loved it really really loved it so the b2 i can understand but i never ran b2 i didn't run dungeons and dragons for a long time as a kid ran it maybe for i don't know three years uh and then i moved into call of cthulhu and stuck with that forever but um i never ran b2 but i did run village of hamlet and i think it would be really wild to run something and then tell my nephew and his friends, oh, hey, by the way, I hope you realize that uh, we're actually playing an adventure that is twice as old as you guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think that'd be pretty wild. So yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of just floating that out as a, uh, as a, as a poll, you know. Because eh. I, I, Dungeon World is pretty interesting if you're not familiar with it. Maybe I'll talk about it on Thursday's show a little bit. Um, powered by the apocalypse, if you're familiar with apocalypse world. So I might talk about it then. Something else, uh, I am actually considering moving the stream to the evenings. Uh, I'm bouncing it around. I think I would get more people watching live. Maybe. I don't know. But then again, it's, it's every day. Or I try to do every day. It might not be as easy to do it every day if I'm doing it at night. And I was thinking maybe like 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, I don't know. Kind of up in the air on that. But um, <clears throat> I think I think more people would check it out. More people would be subscribing uh, if I do it later in the day. So I don't know. It's something I'm bouncing around. I wouldn't do it until probably November simply because I had a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, another reason why I thought maybe I'll do it in the evenings is because my cardiologist wants me to do the cardiovascular rehab. Uh, so I'm going to start doing that probably within the next couple of weeks, week or two. And it'll be three times during the week. And it's got to be during the day. They don't, they don't have it at night. So that's another reason why I'm thinking I might do that as well. All right, so last thing I'm going to do, let's talk about what's coming up on the show. Now, there's no show tomorrow. Uh, I did point out yesterday and last week that uh, I am going into Chicago. I live out in the far suburbs. Uh, I'm going into Chicago. Wizards of the Coast is having a special, like, press event, and we're going to have dinner and drinks and play Betrayal Legacy. 
I think we're going to be seeing a review copy of Betrayal Legacy. I usually usually companies just give you the the review copy when you're there at the event. I'm not saying everyone does, but a lot of times uh, they do that. You know, like North Star Games did that. Uh, so if that's the case, on Thursday's show, I'm going to change things up a little bit because it's usually RPGs on Thursdays. But I will actually do a, an unboxing for Betrayal Legacy if I get the review copy. So that's what's going to be on Thursday's show. If if I don't, right? I don't want to assume, just assume. I did hear from the PR company that does uh, Wizards of the Coast, uh, a lot of their uh, PR, that they're sending me the Axis and Allies and Zombies, and I should have that within a couple of weeks. So that'll be kind of interesting to kind of take a look at that before Halloween. But... Uh, if for some reason there is no review copy of Betrayal Legacy, then I think I'm going to talk about five RPGs that are perfect for Halloween. So, but I think we're going to be doing Betrayal Legacy. All right, anyway, on Friday's show, I will be reviewing Cthulhu Tales from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. So that will be on Friday's show. On Monday's show, I am going to review Fist of Dragonstones, the Tavern Edition from Stronghold Games. So I will be reviewing that. Um, next Tuesday, I don't know. I might go back to back. I might go back to back, do Fist of Dragonstones, and then on Tuesday, I might do Noria, which is another really unique Stronghold game. Uh, it's just, I need, I need to play it one more time. One more time for me to really give my final thoughts on it. So that's how I'm kind of looking at that as well. So that's what's coming up on the show. So I know there are people who are tuning in to see what I think of Archmage from Starling Games. It is designed by, uh, hopefully I get close on these names, Tim Hirema is what I'm guessing, or maybe it's Hirema. And artwork is provided by Engar Adarasa and Dan May. That was easy. Dan May, thanks. The game is for one to four players. There is a special solitaire mode to the game. It's for ages 14 and up. Plays in around one to two hours. Did want to point out, I am reviewing the Collector's Edition, which I am almost positive is still available from Sterling Games. It does carry an MSRP of $80. I do not know if or when a standard retail edition is coming out. Because there was... A difference between, say, for an example, Everdell, the collector's edition was on sale at Gen Con, but it was not available. Uh, the retail edition didn't come out until I think it was last month. Maybe it was this month. But uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what might be going on as far as collector's edition and retail edition. But I do have an idea of what's different between the two. So let's pop on over to the other camera. I've got this set up. And of course, as always, uh, space is at a premium. And I'm going to pop on ye old reading specs. So what I've got, I've, I've set up some of the board. I've kind of laid down some of the uh, some of the materials, the, uh, the components that each of the players are going to utilize as well. So we can kind of squeeze all this in. So the premise of Archmage is... You're, you've got up to four players, right? So you've got up to four mages, and each of them is competing to become the most powerful mage to replace the mysterious archmage who's no longer around. Ooh. So to do so, you've got to go and explore. You've got to recruit followers. Uh, you've got to uh, kind of like promote initiates. And it's, it's very interesting. It is a very interesting style game. And uh, got to say, I mean, it's it's not as if, like, there's a ton of new, like, mechanics that we've, you know, never seen before. But just the way it meshes together is, is pretty unique. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of tour the board, kind of show off some things. So first off, you're going to have, this is the layout. You're going to have uh, these hexes. So in the center of the board, you're going to place... I'm going to pick these up so we can kind of hold it up so folks can see it. 
so we've got sort of the uh, like major races, right? So we've got the major races. We've got the elves, the dwarves, the goblins, demons, dryads, and gnomes. And each of these races actually is attuned to one of six types of magic, or we could say schools of magic. So we've got matter, which is the gnomes. We've got time, which is the elves. We've got dwarves, which is will. We've got the goblins, which are death. Ooh. We got the demons, which is blood magic. And then we have the dryads, which are nature magic. So uh, right off the bat, uh, one of one of uh, Cameron's friends, one of the gang had said, oh, that's kind of weird. How come the elves aren't nature magic? And it's like, well, because we got dryads. <laughs> that's why. And they're like, I don't know. What are those? So I'm like, oh, OK, let me explain what dryad is supposed to be. Like they live in trees and oh, OK, I get it. So that is going to go on to the center of the board. Now, depending on the number of players, you're going to have a certain number of these various different tiles. So we do have the tiles broken down in different types. So we have wilderness tiles that will have this indicator, this symbol on the back. And then we've also got towns, which are actually laid out face up so that you know where the towns are. Then we have others that are camps or uh, encampments, I guess we'll say. And these can be either a camp or it could be a hybrid race. So we do have hybrid races that uh, are available as well. So give you an example, a couple of the hybrid races. We got trolls and we have drow. So I'm just leaving those out so I can kind of show those off. Then the different areas you've got. Uh, let me grab each of these. I yep, already have ruins. Dummy. All right. Where is... Here we go. Library and Crypt. Okay. So as you're exploring the board, because it'll start off with, with a lot of these tiles face down, because you, you have to explore the land. Now, of course, I'm taking up some area here, which you would normally have some of these land tiles. But depending on the number of players... The more players, the more tiles you're going to utilize. So if you're playing, say, a two-player game, you're only going to have three of each of these types, plus uh, three towns, three camps, and three of the hybrid races. So you're going to actually use all the camps, all the hybrid races. So we've got the crypt. So we've got the crypt terrain. And it's going to show you, okay, so what kind of, what kind of magic... Uh, what kind of relics, magic relics, could you get? So the crypt is death magic. The library is time magic. The grove is nature magic. The ruins are matter. So these are like the dwarves. And then we've got the camp. So we've got a camp where you're able to uh, get followers and... All right, there's one more. Where did I miss it? The mine. Oh, sorry. That's what I meant. Ruins is, uh... Yeah, ruins is matter. Oh, it's the gnomes. Sorry, it's the gnomes, not the dwarves. Then we've got the mine. And, of course, that would be will. So we've got... These are the five types of wilderness. These are considered wilderness tiles. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, wait a second, Jeff. Didn't you say there's six types of magic? I don't see. How do you gain blood magic, right? So how are you going to get the, the relics for blood magic? I thought it's kind of interesting. You have to actually, like, kill followers <laughs> to be able to get blood magic. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little, little tidbit, little twist. So uh, as far as, like, the custom... The collector's edition. I believe this is one of the things that's in the collector's edition. So this is like the ruined city in the middle, uh, which actually you're not supposed to be able to go into. But uh, so that sits there. 
So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, so anyway, so next we've got that. So we've got all these different areas that uh, your mages, and I'm just going to have two mages. I've got blue and white. And it's kind of cool because I like how their meeples are unique. So each of the colors have a unique design to them, a unique cut. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, each of the mages also will have a deck of spell cards that they're going to be able to uh, eventually start utilizing. And uh, each of the spell cards, each of the decks will have that mage's image on it. I really like the artwork. For some oddball reason, whenever I see this art, I keep thinking of Elminster from uh, Ed Greenwood's Forgotten Realms for Dungeons and Dragons. I don't, I don't think Gandalf. I think Elminster. <laughs> so, I don't know, kind of weird. And then that is the fourth mage. So one thing I should point out is the, the various spells, the different schools of magic are going to be available to every mage. Uh, and as you play the game, you kind of get the impression these mages are actually not the nicest people in the world. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that they're evil, but, you know, of course, depending on the sort of magic that you kind of delve into uh, is going to kind of determine how you can kind of imagine your mage. But um, the followers that the mages recruit are kind of like cannon fodder in a lot of ways, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So that's why I kind of say that uh, each of the mages are, you know, they're probably like megalomaniacs. You know, that's why they're all competing to be the Archmage. So each of the players is also going to get this little board here that uh, is kind of where their spell book will go. So spells that they have available to them are going to go underneath here. Spells that they've already cast are going to go up in here. So we got that. Then we got this really interesting board, which I really love how... Starling Games has put this together. I think this is really, really nice. Let me grab a quick sip here. Especially because this is actually cut out. So, you know what? Do I have one sitting? Ah, I got one sitting around I can grab. I think. Yep. Kind of hold it up without the, uh, without the counters on it, the cubes and the discs. But if you kind of look, you'll see that, you know, this area is cut out. These areas are cut out. This is cut out down here. Really, really like it because what you're doing is you're tracking the planets, which is kind of the timer of the game. And you're also tracking your uh, your initiates and what school of magic uh, or what, you know, kind of hybrid schools of magic. And you're also tracking your various different relics for each of the types of magic. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. That was uh, really, really nice. Thing I like about it is uh, a lot of times we're, we're pl playing games and stuff, and this has happened when we're playing, uh, you know, right off the top of my head, I can tell you, Terraforming Mars. Uh, we were playing and somebody bumped the table because we were kind of playing on a, a kind of bigger card table. We weren't at the, like, the dining room table playing and everything kind of went scattered. Here, you can kind of bump this around a little bit. Now, maybe your acolytes, like up in here or over here, are gonna move, but you're gonna remember where you had them. Uh, but everything else, you know, you can move this around and everything stays in place. So I really like that, really, really dig that. I think that's pretty cool. So as I mentioned, so you're gonna have the various different types of magic and how many relics you possess from these and you're going to have these six planets. And depending on the number of players, you'll have this in a different alignment. So for an example, if we were playing two players, we would actually have these planets like this. So I'm just pretending it's a four player game to kind of show this off. So completely up to the player is where they're going to place each of these planets. And these planets are all coming into alignment. That's what this center area is it they're all coming into alignment and when all of these planets end up in the center then that triggers the end turn for that player so there is 
there's that built-in kind of timing mechanic. So uh, interestingly enough, the more players you have, the fewer rounds you will actually play. But uh, everything still moves pretty quickly. So you get to decide, okay, so what, how, what kind of magic do I want to have set up here to start off with? So for an example, if you put your will, the orange's will, here, there's a little number one. You'll see underneath the planets, we have one, two, three. And that's actually the starting relics that you're going to have to begin the game. So if you look, I've got them all where they're corresponding. So we got that. So that's, you're going to start off doing that. You're also going to have your followers. Now there are 25 followers for each of the four mages. So there's 100 followers total. So you're going to take 15 of these and you're going to place them out. And these are what's considered, you know, your company. These are the followers you already have. You're able to gain more followers. Now, say for an example, this draw bag here, I believe this is part of the, the uh, collector's edition. I don't think it's in the regular retail edition where you can put the rest of your followers, right? So I put the other 10 into this bag. Thing is, you can just keep them off to the side in a common supply if you want. It's not like a blind draw or anything like that, but I thought it's a cool little, cool little thing. Each of the players gets a little, little draw bag each of the players will also get a mage tower. And once again, these mage towers are all different designs also. So I thought that was kind of cool. Kind of everyone is a little bit unique. So that's what everybody's going to start off with. As I mentioned, you're going to have your spells. We're going to take a closer look at the spells. Now, one thing I'll show. Remember I was talking about how there's a uh, solitaire mode. So in each player's spell book, and these are, uh, see the foil finish to these? That is part of the collector's edition as well. Uh, I think it's cool, but I don't know, maybe it's me. I found the spell cards to be a little harder to read with this foil finish to it. Um, I don't know. It just I, The funny thing is, it's not foil there, you know, where the text is. But I don't know, there's just something about it that kind of made it a little tougher to, for my eyes to pick up. You know, like what school of magic these are. Okay, so anyway, so what we're gonna do here is first thing is if oh wait, you know what? Here I was showing you the solitaire. So we got this if you look here and it just shows it's like the warlord icon right there. That means that these spells are only utilized if you're playing the solitaire game, because you're actually battling against this warlord. And these spells specifically target the Warlord. So they're removed from the each of the players starting decks of spells because they don't apply to a multiplayer game. So we're going to have, uh, first of all, we're going to take a look up in this corner here. This is going to tell you what kind of spell this is. So we've got various levels of spells. We've got three levels. We've got fundamental spells. So anything that we see that has this kind of big, almost hexagonal uh, symbol is a fundamental spell. Then we also see here, this is going to tell us, okay, so what type of magic is this spell? So as we can see here, this one is a time. This is time magic. The art works pretty cool on these two. I like the art. I like the art throughout the game. I think they did a very, very nice job. Then we're going to see, here's an icon. So... What kind of spell is this? So if it's got a lightning bolt, that means the spell takes place immediately. Once you play it, boom, it's it's a kind of a one and done. It's an instant, basically. If we've got these arrows, this means that it'll have an ongoing effect. And if we have an infinity symbol right here, this means that that spell will stay in effect if the mage who cast it continues to pay for it each turn. Basically, they're recasting it. So that is basically the anatomy of each of these spell cards. Now, as you gain advanced spells, the advanced spells will look like this. They'll have this icon here. 
which kind of corresponds to your Borg. So we'll have larger spells. And then if we see the icon here, it says, oh yeah, well, this spell is used in multiplayer and the Warlord. And then of course, this is gonna show us, okay, these are the two kinds of magic. So it's gonna be nature magic as well as uh, matter. So these are are the, the spell, you know, types, schools, whatever you wanna, magic schools. But uh, everybody's got the same spells. So it basically breaks down to each player is going to have six fundamental spells, so one for each type of magic. There are six advanced spells, and there are six master spells. And I will discuss how you're able to get these spells in just a minute. So we've got... I thought this was pretty nice. So not only do we have the rules... Let me show you the rule book. So we got the rule book here. So we got the various different rules. Uh... I would say really nice job. Read through this, really didn't have any uh, questions. Everything was laid out pretty nicely. So we got a different setup for two, three, or four players. Talking about the artist spell casting, what goes on on the player's turn. There's some examples for us as well. We've got the journey's end. We got the end game for our final scoring. And then we've got some clarifications which i thought was kind of cool and then we got the solo play with the the additional rules where uh you're battling the warlord Ooh, boo. uh actually i like the solo game i thought the solo game was really cool uh just another added aspect uh of value to the game plus uh it's kind of a good way for players to kind of begin to understand the game as well so we got the rules but then we also kind of have a handy dandy sheet or i should say card here that kind of explains everything so we've got that so you can have this out and then each of the players will have this tile that tells them you know it's kind of a it's like a you know quick reference tile so it talks about it breaks down each of the rounds, the phases in the rounds. And then on the back, I thought this was really nice. It's just real quick kind of breakdown. Okay, so what do, what do these spells do? Kind of give you an idea of what those spells do. Just real quick kind of bullet point. Now there's usually more info on the actual spell itself, but I just thought that was really neat that you had that. So even like in a two player game, because there's four of these tiles, you can just lay the tiles out like this by you, you know, just flip the one over and uh, you've got all the info right there. So I thought that was really nice uh, as far as uh, kind of going the extra mile to uh, provide the players with uh, some handy dandy info at their fingertips. So, uh, yeah, OK, so let's get into kind of talking about how the game works. So what you're doing is when you first start off, you got, you've got this area that you really don't know what's in the wilderness. These are considered wilderness tiles. So these wilderness tiles have to be explored. You have to discover what they are. So early in the game, the players are all going to be kind of going around the different uh, tiles to find out, okay, what is this stuff? And the thing is, when you, uh, when you discover a new tile, when you uh, explore it, I should say, and find out what it is, you'll actually get a relic of whatever magic that might be. So I thought that was kind of cool. Now, at a certain point, you're going to have found out what everything is. You're going to find out what all the landscape is. And at that point, you're really focusing more on getting your initiates getting them kind of leveled up so you can get more powerful spells uh, and kind of controlling the area a little bit. So first off, you got a preparation phase, which when you enter your first round, you're not going to do because uh, you've got different spells. We got different tokens for different spells. Uh, and some of them just last for uh, the duration of the player's turn until the player comes around to uh, 
to their turn again. That's what those arrows were, right? They're ongoing, but they only last for a turn. Whereas the one that's got the infinity symbol, that is something that can continually be recast. But anyway, so you're going to do that. You're going to update your spell book. You're going to refresh your spells. And then you're going to move one of these planets closer along to coming into alignment. So that's what happens in the preparation phase. And I'll kind of go through that in a sec. But you've got the journey phase. So that's what you're going to start off with in the first round. So you're going to do the journey phase. So let's say, as an example, I'm just going to mess around a little bit. Uh, boom. You're going to get five movement points. So let's say we got this mage here and the mage decides he's going to drop off a follower. Okay. So let's say the white, white wizard, white mage went first. So now it's my turn, right? All right. So I'm the, I'm the blue here. So I'm, I'm I got five movement points. So I'm, I'm coming from here. So I can go in any direction, right? Remember, there's going to be tiles and stuff over here that need to be explored too. So uh, let's say I just come out here and I go, okay, so that's going to be one. That's two. This is three. I'm exploring, so that's four. So that's four movement points right there. So that's going to give me a nature magic relic. Because remember, when you first discover or explore a wilderness tile and you find out what it is, then you get to... Uh, get to take the uh, relic, one relic of the magic type. But I still have one additional move left. So I've got one movement point left. I'm going to move back to the town here, and then I'm going to decide, okay, so I'm going to drop off a follower here. So that is the journey phase. Basically what you're doing in the journey phase, you can travel. So that's just moving to another tile. And the whoops, moving the wrong guy. Move into an adjacent tile. So that's travel. So that's a one-to-one. -one. Unless somebody uh, has cast a spell like there's the entangling vines, which you get to lay those tokens out and it slows down the other mages from moving around. Uh, like I said, there's some various different tokens that I've actually got sitting over here. Uh, so yeah, simply moving one tile, one hex is a movement point. Exploring that hex once you get there is another movement point. So, summed up easily is if you move on to an adjacent tile that's not been explored, it's costing you two to find out what it is. Uh, then you can attack. So, as an example, let's say this had already been uh, already been discovered, and I move my mage onto here. There is no battle. There's no battle between my mage and one of my other, you know, opponent's followers. It's just boom. He's dead. He's gone. And he'll he would go back into the supply for the other player. They wouldn't go back to the company, which are the followers they already have. They would go into the supply. And interestingly enough, as I had mentioned before, if I were to do that, if I were to attack, I would actually gain a blood magic relic, and so would my opponent. My opponent that I just killed their their follower, just vaporize them, whatever, then they'll get a blood magic relic as well. And as I pointed out, that's the only way you're going to get blood magic uh, relics. Well, anyway, so let's go back to the town. So let's say now I've finished up my turn. Then we go into what we call the journey's end phase. So you get you get the bonus of kind of like a bonus action, a bonus ability kind of, of the tile you're on. So as an example here, if I'm on the city, or a town I should say, I can gather either relics or followers based on what I control. And what I control is what I have followers on or what the mage is on. So if I actually controlled different towns, let's say I controlled that town too, I get to do 
anything from both, right? So let's say if there were three towns and I controlled all three towns, I would be able to get three relics, three followers, any combination thereof. And in a town, I can get a relic of any magic, any magic whatsoever. That is, that's what I get. Now, if I were in a camp, oh, these are gremlins, that's fine. Okay, so if I were in a camp here, right? So I got a camp. If I ended my turn there, I could recruit up to three followers to my company. And of course, these come from the supply. Anytime I'm recruiting followers, they're gonna come from the supply. If there are no followers left in the supply, I can't get them. So, uh, but yeah, pretty rare are you gonna run into a, a situation where you don't have any followers that you can draw from or you can pull from your company to do stuff. All right, so if that's what you can do at a camp. Now, if you're at a race enclave, which these are like the, the major races and the gremlin here is a minor race, is a hybrid race is what they call them. So the gremlin is basically, you're looking at black and yellow magic and if you're here and you spend a relic of the hybrid, so we got death magic there, we've got the matter magic here, I can recruit an initiate, right? So now this is an initiate. I can get an initiate of either death magic or matter, and I would place them there. So I'll say for an example, I go, oh, so I'm going to put my initiate in the matter. Now, when that happens, I go and I look up where is the first spell for matter. There we go. So I would gain this spell because now I have initiate in the matter magic. I would gain this spell and that spell would actually go face down like that. Because when you get a spell, you can't use it. You gotta wait till the next turn for you to be able to use the spell that's in your spell book. Because this is, this is actually my spell book. So I'd be like, cool. So I got my first initiate, nice. Got it over here. Now, if I am over in one of the major races, right? So for an example, if I came here for the demons, if I'm in the demons, and this, remember, this is where you end your turn for your mage. The followers, all the followers do are, they're just kind of area control. They're just showing, hey, I control this area. And that's basically about all they're really doing out on the board here. They're cannon fodder. They get wiped out pretty easy. All, all you got to do is a mage has to go strolling over there, uh, or you start casting some spells. So if I went over here, then... And I said, okay, so let's say I've been like just attacking like crazy and I've got six blood magic. I can gain up to three followers for every two points of blood magic I would spend. So I could take my blood magic all the way down to zero and actually gain, as long as I had them available, in my company, I could gain three of these down in here in blood magic. I don't know if you're necessarily going to do that too often, but it's something you can do. So that's what these tokens do as well. Now, if we were in the wilderness, let's say we're in the grove here, that's where I ended my turn. I can take the action of that wilderness tile. So basically, because I'm here, I can get another nature magic. There you go. I, I choose to do that. Then I have an option of I can place wards, which basically, if I had a follower on here, that protects him a little bit. It's just you have to spend an extra movement point to attack. So for an example, let's say uh, we had the white white mage coming from the gremlins and he comes here. That'd be one movement point. You have to spend a movement point 
to get rid of the ward, and then another movement point to remove my follower. So that's what the wards do. The other thing I can do, and it doesn't cost me anything, remember, dropping off the follower doesn't cost me anything either. Uh, and I should point out that these ward tokens, these are also something that I do believe are only in the collector's edition of the game because we also have these tokens here, these counters, which uh, I b are actually the um, the wards for when you're uh, basically going to be getting like the retail edition. So uh, there's all different stuff. We've got corruption. There's a lot of these tokens that only, uh, only are used when you're playing the solitaire game too. So the other thing I can do is I can actually build my mage's tower. I can build my mage's tower here and then it's like, okay, that's that's my home base. You can only build your mage's tower once. You can't move it around. It's going to be stuck right there. So here's, here's a few items as far as movement that are important to know. You cannot move your mage into an area that's got your opponent's mage tower. You cannot move into a tile that another mage is on. Movement is blocked off. So one, one way that you'll do things with the mage's tower is you might put that mage's tower someplace to block off your opponent from getting to some other resource, some other tile, or at least making them have to expend more movement points to get there. So if once you do have a mage tower, you can either recruit an initiate, right? So you can recruit an initiate. Remember, these are kind of like followers down here. Once they hit this board, they're initiates. So you can you can actually recruit an initiate of any of the schools of magic. So let's say for an example, I had this here already and I came back to my mage tower. I go, okay, well, I'm recruiting an initiate and I'm doing death magic. What I can also do is I can actually promote the apprentices, right? The, the apprentices here. And to do that, I would actually go and I would place two of the apprentices or initiates, whatever we want to consider them, right over here. And what that basically means is the two of them duel it out. You know, they're, they're fighting for supremacy. Like I said, remember, these mages aren't like good guys. They're all kind of using, using people, <laughs> using... Uh, their followers kind of as like cannon fodder just to give, provide them more power. So what you'll do is you're actually going to lose one of these. You're going to place it back into the supply. But now you've trained up one of your initiates. One of So now what will happen is you would go and you're going to go in and you're going to take a look at these cards. Cards that have that item that icon up there and you're going to look at okay so i've got death and blood so i would gain the imprison spell and of course that is now an advanced spell the master basically what we would need to do is i would have once again promoting my initiates I would have the two of them battle it out, and then they would go here. I'd have the one. This would go back into the supply. And now I would look for, okay, so where's the master spell for death magic? Right there. Corrupt. And that's how I would gain the spell. The way you gain spells is by promoting your acolytes, your initiates, by promoting them up. Now, the cool thing that takes place in Archmage is when, like, say, for an example, I'm here, I've got the two, I've got blood and death, so I would actually have two spells in my fundamentals. Eh, just for the heck of it, right? Just going to throw those in there. I know this doesn't match. I'm just tossing it in there, right? So I would have these two spells. But when I go and promote them when they battle it out and only one survives I would end up losing these spells because I no longer have initiates here but that's how I gain that advanced spell 
really kind of interesting how this works. So what will eventually start happening is you might end up something like this. So you would have your your initiates. So you would have you would end up having the fundamental blood and death spells available to you. You would have the advanced blood and death available to you. You would also have ah uh, sorry I would need to have one there. You would have the initial uh, the fundamental will spell available to you. Then you would have the death will spell, and then you would have the death spell. So you'll see kind of a layout for your your uh, initiates. They'll, they'll kind of start taking over a portion of your board here. You normally won't see them all spread out because it doesn't make a ton of sense to have, say, like, okay, so I've got matter and then I've got this. Well, yeah, okay, so I get that fundamental spell, but I'm still going to have to put somebody over here and then fight it out with these guys to get that and then make sure I promoted somebody up to here so they could fight to get there. So uh, you won't see a lot of stuff spread out, but this is also where you kind of start custom tweaking your mage to the kind of magic spells you want to use. Now, I, will want, I will point out that some of the spells, until you kind of get the, the, basically the grasp of what the spells do, and it's, it's important that the players actually sit down and kind of look at the spells themselves and kind of go through the like bullet points of each of the spells to kind of get a feel for, oh, okay, so that's the kind of mage that I want to be. I want to focus on this. Now, part of it will also fall into, well, let's flip all these over here because eventually you're going to get to the point where you're no longer exploring and you're really just focusing on trying to um, gather your followers. Wow, ruins all around there. Uh, gather your followers, uh, take over areas on the board, and uh, improve your magic spells. Because the name of the game is not necessarily the areas you control. The name of the game is have the most powerful spells. Because when we get to the final scoring, the spells are what count the most. But when you are controlling areas during the final scoring, you will get points if you control the majority of a specific type of area. So, for an example, if I control these three ruins in a two-player game, I'm going to get two victory points for having the majority of control over these three tiles. If it came down to each of the players each controlled one, say, yeah, let's get one of these white guys out. One grove, right? So, of course, because I have the wizard's tower here, uh, so I would have control here. What you end up doing is if it's a tie, then each of the players is going to get a victory point. So that's how that'll work. Uh, like I said, it becomes less about area control towards the end of the game and more about having this, the spells. Because what will happen is for every fundamental spell you have, it's going to be a victory point. For every advanced spell... Oh, wait a second. Am I getting that right? Maybe I'm wrong. I, I think it's two. Two for fundamental. No, I'm right. It's one. I don't know why I was freaking out there. Uh, so you get one victory point for a fundamental spell, for each fundamental spell. You get two for each advanced spell. And you get four for the master spell. And of course, once again, it's all about the victory points. Now, it's very possible for you to end up in a tie with victory points. And then there's a bunch of different tiebreakers that, uh, you know, who's got the most master spells, most advanced, most fundamental, and so on. And it just even, it gets down to the point where, okay, who's got the most uh, initiates on their board? So uh, it's not one of these games where it's kind of like, oh, well, we finished in a tie. And it's like, okay, so um, first thing is uh, look to see who's got the most X, Y, Z. And it's like, you're still tied. And it says, okay, well, if that's the case, then... Uh, yeah, it's a shared victory. Da -da -da. No. I mean, you would really, really be hard-pressed to end up being tied at the end of the game as far as the, um, the tiebreaker. So let's talk a little bit about magic spells. 
And I swear, this game comes across as being way more complex than it than it is. Because once you get the grasp of it, it's very, very easy. So you've got your spells. Now, once you got the spells, let's say for an example, well, let's say I've got stone skin. I'm gonna push this down a little bit. So remember, when you've got your spell book, the available spells are gonna go under here. Okay? So this is a uh, will. This is a will spell. This is a spell that's going to last for uh, the entire turn. So once I, I cast it, this spell is going to be around until my next turn. And it's a fundamental spell, so it's going to cost me one relic of that school of magic. So I have one will. I'm going to spend that will. Boom. And I'm able to cast the spell. I'm going to move the spell up here, and then I'm going to do whatever the spell tells me says, whenever an opponent attacks one of your followers, you may return that follower to your company instead of the supply, and you still get a blood relic. So that's what Stone Skin does. All right, so I put it up there. That means that spell is no longer available to me this turn. So cast that spell. It stays in effect until my next turn. Now, when we get to that preparation phase, the prep phase, that's when you're going to refresh your spellbook. And that's what refreshing the spellbook means. It's going to take spells that you've cast uh, and place them back in the available slot for you. Now, remember, as I pointed out, you've got spells that have the infinity symbol. It, it would stay up there if you're planning on spending the relics to recast that and keep that going. If you decide you're not going to, it would go back here. Remember, as I mentioned, when you first get your spell, when you get an accolade who goes into that, that school of magic or gets more specialized as they kind of fight each other for, for you know, for the knowledge. Uh, when you first get the spell, it's going to go face down. That's another thing that happens in the preparation phase is that spell becomes available to you. So really easy as far as how do you how do you get the spells? How do you cast the spells? Basically, if you have the relics, you can spend the relics to cast the spell. So, fundamental costs you one, advanced costs you two, master costs you three relics of that uh, particular type of magic. So, when you've got a magic spell, so for an example, like Shadow, right? So, this is a will death spell. You can spell, spend relics from either one of those. So I thought that's kind of cool. So if you had like, say for an example, you've got an advanced spell and it's the death will spell or will death, I should say. You could, and it's advanced, you'd spend the one, spend the one, cast the spell. Other thing that you do in the prep phase, preparation phase, once you've played your first turn, you're always going to, your first round, Thing you're going to do is you're always going to move one of these planets closer to the center. So for an example, I would say, ah, oh, okay, I'm going to move the will over here. And when I do that, I will actually gain a relic of that type of magic. So you're going to do that basically to start off every one of your turns except the first one. So it is eventually going to do, and this is where you kind of, at the start of the game, once you have an idea of the different kinds of spells that are available and what they do and the kind of stuff that you kind of like want to play your strategy for, you're going to set up the sort of magic that you uh, think you're probably going to use most probably further away. Even though you're only going to start with one, you're going to still gain one as this continues to move. Now, once these get moved to the middle, they don't move anymore and you no longer gain any sort of relics from that planet. And eventually what's going to happen is all the planets are going to be all lined up like so. Just like that. They're all going to be in the middle. And when that happens, that activates your last turn. It's your last opportunity to do stuff. And usually what will happen on that last turn is you're going to send your mage out and your mage is probably going to go on a killing spree to try to knock followers out from your opponents. Now, here's, here's kind of an odd thing about the final scoring. 
So once everybody is taking, once you take your turn, you are now going to count up your victory points. So whatever you control, the different spells, you're going to count up your victory points and you're going to have your total. Um, there is, where did I got? Uh, oh, right here. One of the things that's also included in the game, I gotta be honest, we really didn't utilize this, but we've got these like score sheets, these uh, kind of, you, you kind of pay attention to what you're doing and you can jot down what's going on uh, in your rounds. We didn't really utilize these, but uh, I think these are also just part of the collector's edition and there are actually two pads of these. But uh, like I said, we really didn't utilize them. But what you'll do is you're going to write down your, your victory points. So you're going to say, okay, so for an example, let's say I've got, uh, I don't know, 15 victory points. Now the next player is going to take their final turn because everybody's going to start lining up their planets all in the same round. What they're going to do is now they're going to go and they're probably going to start wiping out areas that I control, that I finished controlling in the game. And it doesn't change my final victory point total. It actually doesn't matter. It's kind of like once once a player's victory point total is done, it's been calculated, that's it. You're not going to lose points for somebody coming along and taking away control of various different areas. Uh, kind of strange how you would, how you do it. I mean, I, I understand it uh, because it would kind of be like, well, if you were the first player, you're going to get really shellacked because everybody can go and just take all your stuff over and then you get no points. So I get that. I understand that. But uh, it's just kind of odd. It's a little little strange. A little strange how that works. So like I said, that is pretty much how you're going to score. If you control the vast majority, or I should say the majority of the areas, then you get two victory points for that type of area. If you're tied for control of that type of area, each of those tied players is going to get one victory point. Uh, if you are not tied or have the most, you get nothing. So it will happen where you have players that their main focus was on getting spells. They didn't really care too much about uh, the area control aspect. So they're going to get their victory points, the majority of them, from their spell book. And as I pointed out before, it's one victory point for fundamental, two victory points for advanced, and four victory points for every master spell that you have. And uh, like I said, whoever's got the most victory points is the winner. So what do I think of Art Mage, Arch Mage, I should say. So a lot of stuff I like. Uh, component quality is excellent. Uh, I like some of the little extras as far as the collector's edition. I like the fact that there's a solitaire mode that's in it uh, where you're, you're actually fighting this warlord. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, because it doesn't strike you as a game that would have solitaire play. So I thought that's kind of neat. Uh, I think the spells are pretty cool. Some of the spells seem really powerful. Um, like like early spells. I'm not talking the master spells. But there are ways to kind of um, strategize to prevent those spells from really affecting you too much. Or there's like countermeasures you can take. So uh, once again, this is the kind of game where you're going to have to play it a few times to get an idea of these different spells and how they work. I like, I love these boards. I love these um, like tracking boards. I think these are fantastic. This is like one of my favorite things about the game. Really, really like it. Really, really nicely done. Uh, and I love the fact that we can, you know, we can be playing and somebody actually, cause one thing that happens to me a lot, I'll have like my elbow on the table. And if I get like different cards that you have to put little tokens or cubes or what have you on them never fails i always seem to like lean on one of them and the card sticks to my elbow so when i move the elbow all of a sudden it's like pfft, everything goes flying will not happen with this does not happen so definitely appreciate that uh i think this is a lot of fun like i said the game seems to be harder than it actually is because really all you're doing each turn is you're moving you're using your five movement points to move your mage around, you're either traveling, you're exploring, or you're fighting. And once things have been explored, you're pretty much sending your mage around to go beat on people to take control away, at least from your neighbors. 
And then a lot of times you're going to make them head back to either the mage's tower or to one of those uh, one of those hexes with the major races, especially if you get a lot of artifacts because you can actually hire a bunch of initiates. So I think that's pretty cool. You can recruit that. Uh, a lot of stuff I really like. Now, there are a few things that I kind of was like, hmm. So one of them, and I think it, it, it mainly is that I think it's going to affect the replayability of Archmage more than anything else. Because we play, I played it four times. I played it once solitaire. I played it uh, once with three players, and I played it twice with four players. I really like the game regardless. Two players, yeah, I like it two players, but I like it more with four. There's just a lot more, I don't want to say chaos, but there's a lot more everybody kind of like eh, bashing on each other and stuff like that as opposed to just head to head. So I do, I do dig it with more players than two. And the solitaire is fun. Um, but everybody has the same spells available to them. And you will find, especially when you have four players in that, you'll have uh, a couple of mages who might be trying to focus on the same sorts of magic. So it gets a little sticky then. Uh, I would have liked to have seen more spells for each of the schools, because really it breaks down to you've got one spell for the fundamental magic, you've got one spell for the intermediate magic, and then you have one spell for the master magic. So you don't have a ton of spells, so the players all start kind of getting the same spells in their spell books, depending on what, what way they're kind of leaning towards their magic or what's around them. Because a lot of times that determines on you know, how somebody's going to go about putting their spell book together because you may not want to be traveling all the way to the other side of the board to try to get some of these resources. You're going to kind of focus on the resources that are around you and that will determine the kind of magic you want to pursue. So I would have liked to have seen just a little more variety in spells. Um, maybe that's something that's on the horizon. Maybe that's uh, an expansion that could be in the works. Something else I think would be kind of cool is if there were like monsters that the mages would fight because really the whole gist of the game is that you're, you're trying to develop your knowledge, your magical knowledge. You're using, you're using your initiates to, uh, to discover that and, you know, basically fighting each other over it and removing the initiates from play to en enable you to like master the schools of magic. But I would have liked to have seen like maybe, and once again, this is just my thoughts. It would have been cool maybe if there's like wandering monsters that would actually go around the board and if, you know, you roll a die because there is in the solitaire um, aspect in the solo play, you're going to roll a die, a six-sided die for the warlord to control where he goes. So it would have been nice if we had like some wandering monsters that would go around. And if they, if they move into an area that you've got a follower protecting, they, they kill him, right? Even if there's like a ward or something like that, or maybe if they, if they attack, the ward gets removed because remember, you can only drop wards off where your mage is. You can't just go, Oh, well, you know, boom, I'm going to just throw it wherever I want. Um, I would have liked to have seen that. I think that would have added a little more uh, variety to the game because I can honestly see players ending up playing this, especially if you play with the same group. Players playing this kind of almost the same exact way every time. The only thing that's going to be different is going to be the layout and where the various different wilderness and uh, camp tiles end up being located because like the town tiles are always in the same spot depending on how many players there are. The camp tiles are always in the same spot, although they're either going to be a hybrid race or a camp. You don't know, but they're always in the same spot. So I don't know. We would have thrown in a little bit more variety, but I actually really like Archmage. Now I've played three Starling Games titles. So I've played Everdell. I have played Black Orchestra. And I have now played and reviewed, and I've reviewed all of these. Uh, now I've played and reviewed Archmage, and I really like all three. Uh, I would say Archmage is probably 
my least favorite of the trio, but I still really like it. I think it's really good. And I think, wow, if they if there were some like some more spells, maybe some monsters to kind of throw some variety in, maybe even have it where your followers could go off and fight monsters. I think that would be kind of cool. Uh, and it would probably bump the score up a little bit. But all in all, I think this is very worthy of belonging in your collection. It looks like it's complicated. It is not. Once you've played a couple of rounds, everybody starts to understand exactly what's going on. Uh, and the strategies start to evolve even more once people understand what the different spells do. So on a scale of 1 to 10, I give Archmage a very, very solid 8.2 out of 10. As I mentioned, the Collector's Edition is still available. This is for 1 to 4 players, ages 14 and up. And I gotta be honest, I think that might be a little high as far as um, wrapping your head around the game. Now, granted, there's a lot of small pieces. There's little cubes and little discs, stuff like that. So, yeah, so 14 and up as far as, like, kids swallowing the components. I completely understand that. But honestly, I think, you know, a 12-year-old could pretty much grasp this. Uh, two hours is probably a little high as far as the gameplay. We played four players. Once we got the hang of it, we were done at about 90 minutes, tops. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is available now. It, the Collector's Edition can be had from Starling Games for $80. I do not know about the retail edition. I know there's a retail edition, and I believe it's probably like $60. So definitely, if you're like, if you kind of like, uh, kind of like feeling like a, a, a magic user who's, you know, who's, who's trying to, uh, to like rise up in the ranks to be the, you know, to be the greatest wizard ever, and kind of like using people along the way, your followers, as kind of like cannon fodder, I think you're definitely going to dig Archmage. All right, so that is it for today's show. As I mentioned, no show tomorrow. I am going down into the city. Uh, but on Thursday, I should, fingers crossed, be doing an unboxing of Betrayal Legacy from Avalon Hill, which is an imprint of Wizards of the Coast. So I always like to say when you're not watching a video on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. I'll be back on Thursday. And as always, thank you very, very much for watching. Thanks again for watching The Daily Dope, presented by The Gaming Gang. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. And if you dig the channel, please subscribe. If you'd like to check out our previous episode, click right here. And if you want to check out a somewhat randomly selected episode, give a click right down here. It'll be like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You just don't know what you'll get. Once again... Thanks for watching, and I'm Jeff McAleer.